My name is Jalali Anand. I'm from Paris in France. And, uh, I'm co-chairing the session on biomarker for sepsis with you, the boss. Nice to see you. So um, we have a huge opportunity to have a very uh, expert in the field. Uh, we will be discovering with the first talk, uh, Mervyn Singer, what's, what's coming new today, or maybe tomorrow, or maybe after Not tomorrow, after. or maybe in 10 years, but so microphone is yours, Mervyn. Lovely. Thank you very much, Laddie. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. That's a good start. Good afternoon, everyone. Right. Novel infection diagnostics. Dare I say, I think we're in a bit of a mess at the moment. You know, we have a patient in front of us. Oh, he could be septic. But lots of questions. Does he actually have, or he, she, they, actually have an infection? If so, what's the bug? If we're going to use something to treat it, what do we use? And obviously, we're aware of an increasing problem with antimicrobial resistance. And I'm not going to talk today about all of the other challenges we've got. Wouldn't it be nice to pick up the patient who goes on to become critically septic before they do so? About a third of patients present to a healthcare practitioner before they re-present to hospital with sepsis. Antibiotic levels, completely different talk. But again, we give one size fits all. Oh, we lower a bit in renal failure. But the studies that have been done show many patients are underdosed. Many patients actually get too much in terms of um, MIC and optimal, um, at least circulating blood concentrations. And I'm not even going to touch the host response today. It's another story. I'm just going to focus on the bug. But, is that pretty? That won a prize in a photography. It's not mine, sadly, but it's a lovely picture, isn't it? We're still quite backward. We're still relying, or we, our microbiology lab colleagues, are still relying on techniques that was first developed about 150 years ago. And it still takes days to grow something, speciate it, and then tell us which antibiotics will work. Is it? A bit of a sad indictment that in 150 years we're still doing the same thing. And if you look at blood cultures, the positivity rate's only about 10 to 15 percent. And increasingly, you know, I'll touch a little bit on polymicrobial later on, but sometimes, oh, it's a staph epi, is it significant or not? Of all these negative samples, why are they negative? Could it be related to the fact that it's a bug that's difficult to grow? A virus, some fungi, etc. Mycobacterium. The patient may have already been treated with an antibiotic, which prevents the growth in the bottle. There may be no organism, at least in that sample. I'll touch on that in the next slide. There may not be any infection at all. So there are lots and lots of different reasons why we have negative blood cultures. And again, something, uh, I hate the word or the term bloodstream infection, it's meaningless. Can we please get rid of it? We should be talking about bacteremia. But bacteremia is actually caused by very, very, very tiny amounts of organisms, bacteria in the blood. And we're talking about below 10 colony forming units per mil, 10 per mil. And in that same mill, you've got five to ten million white cells. So I would argue it's more a matter of, uh, of a sort of failed surveillance by the white cells rather than teeming bacteria. Even with bacteria, uh, sorry, endocarditis, where the infection's in the bloodstream, you'll get into the hundreds or maybe occasionally into the thousands. But essentially, what's circulating in the blood a very, very, very few bacteria. And there are lots of studies, they're quite old, but clearly that's why the recommendation is to take more blood when you're doing a culture, because you'll increase your yield. So ideally, you know, authorities recommend take 30 or 40 mils to actually improve the yield. But even then, you still only have a 10 to 15% positivity rate. <laughs> 
And uh, approximately 10% of these positive cultures grow multiple organisms, and so our lab decides whether or not to tell us. But increasingly, there's work coming through that perhaps polymicrobial infections may be more important than we recognise, and perhaps the bugs we're not treating merit treatment. You know, just because it's a 10 to the 4 rather than a 10 to the 5, which gets the lab excited, Perhaps the 10 to the 4 organisms are much more virulent. Maybe. So we should be, I think, smarter and faster. So we have our sick patient. And we want to know very early on, is there a bug there or not? Is there an infection or not? Because you need the bug for the infection to occur. And then we need to know rapidly what the antimicrobial sensitivities are. And ideally, we want to know what's called phenotypic ASTs. So will the bug actually be killed by the antibiotic rather than genes? So there are now companies coming out with antimicrobial resistance genes, but there's, I think, from what I was told, the last count, there's over 1,500. It's probably much more now. So just because the, we, we can identify a few of these resistance genes, it doesn't mean our piptazobactam will actually work, and vice versa, actually. And wouldn't it be nice to know preemptively if that patient with infection will go on to become critically ill? And again, not part of this talk, but the, the theranostic, the host response marker to tell us, oh, what immunomodulatory drug should I be using in that patient? So it's a package. It's not one thing in isolation. And what do we want as a clinician? Instant gratification. When do we want it? Now. I don't want to wait two days to find out if I'm giving the wrong antibiotic. I want to know within hours. And I think the patient probably would too. This is something I was involved with a number of years ago. It was actually a really good system. It was a bit clumsy, too expensive, needed a lot of technician time. But direct from blood, you didn't need to wait for cultures. It would take about six hours of work, but up to 800 pathogens could be identified direct from blood. So you didn't need to wait one, two days or whatever for a culture to grow. And uh, this is a sort of multi-center European study. And in red, you can see those are the positive blood cultures. In blue, there were these molecular diagnostics that could identify the same bugs and more. There were a lot of culture negative, but molecular diagnostic positive samples. You can see it on average about three times more. And interestingly, we did a post hoc analysis. The patients who were culture negative, bug uh, molecular test positive, had a much higher mortality than those that were culture negative, molecular test negative. So we're missing with our 150-year-old techniques, a lot of bugs that are potentially treatable. And there are actually really impressive new technologies coming through. I'm just going to flick through some of them. You know, this is the Biofar one. Again, you need a positive blood culture. But again, you don't need to wait a, a much longer period of time. You've got, you, you know, uh, with PCR, you've got a whole variety of bugs and some resistance genes. You know, other companies... Again, identification in two hours from a positive blood culture. The TT system, a limited number of bugs in three to five hours, direct from blood. The Cavella, which I think this is on their website. I don't think it's yet launched, but they're claiming they can do a few more bugs in one hour, direct from blood. And Depol, so this is a Spanish company I'm doing stuff with. And they're hoping, they're going to hopefully launch soon, but nearly 300 pathogens direct from blood within an hour. So, wow, this, you know, it's speeding things up. We'll know much quicker than our conventional um, resources what the bug is. And it's not just blood. You know, Roche have got a whole variety of panels by Meria, etc., where you can look here, for example, at respiratory, gastrointestinal, meningoencephalitis, pneumonia, bone and joint, and these are adapted to the type of bug affecting the CSF or the chest or whatever. Here I've just shown the pneumonia panel as an example. 
So these are the commonest. It won't pick up every, but it will probably pick up more than 90% of the currently known pathogens that cause respiratory tract infection. And you can do these literally direct from the sample in an hour or two, really quick. In fact, again, plug for the Biofar system. We were using it during COVID. We were doing some trials and they allowed us to keep it during COVID. And there was all the issues, I'm sure you'll remember, of, oh, does this patient have a bacterial infection? Have they developed one while they're on the ICU or fungus or whatever? And so it was actually quite reassuring to say, no, can't find anything there. Hold off the antibiotics. Uh, this is something which I think is quite fun. Um, we're just about at our place to start clinical trials. This is uh, looking into the lung. This is, oopsie daisy, sorry, let me just go back one. Eh. Let me just go back one. So, let me, sorry, I'll show you the thing. So, Kev Dallywell um, is a professor of respiratory medicine in Edinburgh. And there's this academically funded project where through a bronchoscope, you can put fiber optic probes and actually look into the lung. This is the human lung. Isn't that beautiful? So you can actually visualize. So you have to make like a mini, mini pneumothoraces. But they've done it up to about, I think, 25 times on the intensive care unit in patients in Edinburgh. And there'll be three other sites, including where I work. We'll be hopefully starting on it in, within the next year. And there's another lumen where you can inject small amounts, you know, 25 microliters or whatever, of a probe. And these probes can show different things. So again, this comes from Edinburgh. The top left is the patient with edema. And you can see it looks a bit sort of waterlogged. The next one is alveolar collapse. But the one for this talk I'll focus on, do you see the little twinkling stars? They're bacteria. So you can actually visualize bacteria and up the, the lumen, the narrow lumen, you can aspirate and then hopefully get a quick idea of the bugs in the area. So you can look at the X-ray or the CT scan and go to that area and try and identify which bugs are there at the site of infection. Quick word about metagenomics. So again, clever technology. So it's not just looking at one thing. This is looking at every bit of DNA that's present in a sample. So again, multiple bacteria, the DNA will be detected. So you can pick up multiple organisms and entities. And I wrote with one of our microbiologists this thing saying, I think it sounds very logical. You combine the pathogen identification with host metagenomics and the pair together might, may reinforce the fact that this is a likely to be a real infection rather than, for example, colonization. Very quickly, I'll just touch through this study from the Langelier group in San Francisco. Again, there is a number of patients they took with sepsis, proven by a bloodstream infection, sepsis, which they'd identified the bug but didn't find it in the blood, no sepsis, suspected sepsis, indeterminate. And they did both this host and pathogen metagenomic, both RNA and DNA. They did next-gen sequencing on the blood, the plasma, and they put together the host and the microbe to give a probability that this patient is likely to have an infection. So in the pathogen, you can see they were pretty good. I think it was something like 97, 98% success rate. If it was in the blood culture, they picked it up actually uh, with the micro, you know, the molecular technique. And again, they looked at the, the weight of the uh, bacteria and even in the control group, there were some bacteria, but there was a significantly greater amount in those who were septic. And the host response, again, not surprisingly, some things go up, some things go down. And they found that they, there was a differential pattern in those with a viral infection compared to those with a bacterial infection. And very quickly, I'll just touch on some of these, but if it's above 0.5 probability, above 50% chance that this is likely to be an infection, so the host and the pathogen diagnostic. And so you've got, this is on the ones who are bloodstream positive um, cultures, and you can see that a large amount of the time the test said the same. So Right at the very bottom, you've got 50% probability, but the majority were 100 or 90 or whatever. And they were the bugs on, on the uh, x-axis. These are the patients where 
they didn't have sepsis. And interestingly, the majority fell below this 50% probability, although there were a few they probably missed. And look, and the virus that was probably missed too. So there was some evidence in some patients that perhaps they'd missed the fact that the patient had sepsis. What about those who were suspected? So you would expect suspected, some will have it, some won't. And you can see some did have it, and according to their test, some didn't. And the indeterminate where they weren't sure, again, some had it or a virus, and some didn't have it. So again, this isn't quick. It needs obviously a lot of lab time, etc. They think, you know, I think they claimed in the paper, yes, working hard, you could do it in 24 hours. So it needs to be sped up, etc., etc. It's currently expensive, things will get cheaper. But again, it's a glimpse into what potentially is available. And this is what they claimed. 99% um, of the bugs that were found in blood culture predicted sepsis in 74% of the suspected cases, 89% where they weren't sure. So again, looks promising. A way to go though. Finally, quick points. Have I got time? Oh, no. God, six seconds. Very quickly. Do I care if it's a Pseudomonas or an E. coli or a Klebsiella? Does the patient care? They just want to get the right bug. And um, basically, that's what I want to know. The right antibiotic, that's what I want to know. And again, microbiologists in the crowd might moan at me, but I would argue, do you need to know the MIC and the breakpoint for that bug if there's a phenotypic test that tells you ex vivo that the bug is being killed by the antibiotic at a certain MIC, to me that seems good enough. And these are happening within a few hours. So very quickly I'll shoot through this. Two hours from blood culture, seven hours from blood culture, three to five hours, two to four hours from blood culture. And I've just reviewed a paper where they claimed you could do it without even needing blood cultures. So again, the technology is coming through where we'll get answers far more quickly as to what antibiotics we should be using. So in summary, and apologies for running over, exciting times ahead, lots and lots of challenges. We've got to show clinical utility to justify the cost. They're not going to be cheap. The health economics, clinical buy-in, and we need labs unless we get point of care devices that can offer a 24-7 service. And I'll finish there. Sorry for running over. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Mervyn. Ti time for one question. Short question, short answer. I don't want to steal the question, but if That's no question is... <clears throat> okay, just, could you just clarify for us whether these... Uh, fantastic molecular techniques uh, differentiate between dead bacteria and, yeah. and living bacteria because I think it's important yeah. for the so, diagnosis of infection. So yeah, sorry, I, I didn't have time to go into that. But yeah, the, they will pick up dead bacteria. You know, clearly it's, it's DNA. Um, I, I think to my way of thinking, that's why it's putting it together because clearly and there are these rapid techniques for doing AST, which I didn't have time to get to, but it requires the bugs to be alive and to multiply ex vivo. And then you can see with light scattering or confocal techniques, etc., or there's some laser techniques, you can see how quickly, or if the bug is being destroyed or it's not growing as it should do, double, double, double every 15 minutes or so. And that's what we rely on with the human eye in the lab at the moment. This can do it much more sensitively, much earlier. So, uh, you know, I think together it's absolute great question and absolutely the answer. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. So, I got a lot of questions on how this can influence my clinical practice, and therefore I want to invite uh, Professor Dawala to the podium to answer all those questions for us in the next 15 minutes. It's going to be a challenge, of course, in 15 uh, minutes. And yeah, well, a lot of cool stuff coming our way, uh, Mervyn. I'm stick with the, um, I will have a look at the regular sepsis biomarkers as we've known them and as we've been using them in the past years and wondering whether we are really, whether, whether these, these biomarkers are ready for use in, uh, in clinical practice. Um, these are my um, uh, disclosures. Now, I'm sure all of you will agree that sepsis is a quite complex uh, thing. And this is only you know, what uh, gives, gives you an overview of what happens in the epithelium. And uh, lots of other things happen. And it's just to show you uh, 
that maybe, just maybe, it's quite naive and, and, and um, maybe a bit of hubris, assuming that this complex phenomenon, we can reduce this to just one protein, one biomarker, and then set a certain cutoff above which we think, well, the disease is present um, uh, or not. And I just leave, you, um, leave this as, as food for thought as we move on to the rest of my um, uh, slides. Now, the perfect biomarker, it, it remains an eternal quest, I'm afraid, and I'm, I will show you what research has been done and where we stand at um, this moment. And it's actually quite sobering, and so it's no surprise that we are now looking for alternative strategies to try to diagnose infection or monitor uh, uh, therapy. So the perfect biomarker doesn't exist. Now, it doesn't say that there are no options. This is just a few biomarkers that you can consider in patients with uh, sepsis, and all of them have been investigated. So it's not that there are no options to study. And a lot of money and a lot of time has been spent on studying biomarkers in, uh, in, in sepsis. I'm sure that many of you actually have done that uh, research. Uh, this is probably also why we're now moving to more advanced techniques, so I won't be covering omics and everything related to that. But we're now looking at more sophisticated solutions, I think, to, uh, to diagnose sepsis and to guide our uh, treatment. So when we think of usefulness in the clinical practice, um, it's not just about sensitivity or specificity of the test. Does it really help us? And there's a few things to consider. You can consider, of course, prognosis. The biomarker helps us to, to uh, prognosticate in, in our patients. Um, but the question for me in clinical practice, does it really help when caring for the patient? Does it really help you to make an informed decision to, um, to guide the treatment in this patient? Of course, we would love to have a biomarker that helps us accurately diagnosing a particular disease, whether it's infection or sepsis or something else. But the question is, is it better, is it faster than what we have, than the alternatives that we have? And, and also, can it be the single one parameter, as I just uh, mentioned at the uh, start? We could, of course, also use biomarkers to monitor therapy. And I will be speaking about the role of biomarkers in guiding the duration of antimicrobial therapy later in this session. But does it really change the care or does it just, you know, kind of help us um, or, or comforts our mind when we have taken a certain uh, decision already and we use the biomarker to just confirm that decision. Because it often strikes me that a certain biomarker is used as an argument to stop in one situation and the same biomarker at the same level may be used to initiate antimicrobial therapy in another one. So maybe it's more often about just finding evidence that supports the conclusion that we have already made. This is the technology we use quite often in our clinical practice, I think. We've seen the fancy the devices that Mervyn uh, uh, used, but quite often, actually, we, we just make an estimated guess and we try to form a construct. We use biomarkers, clinical examination, uh, and then something happens and we make our decision. Now, just before going into details, let's just for a moment take a step back and think about test characteristics and how we use it, because in clinical practice, we don't use sensitivity and specificity. We translate this to positive, negative, predictive value, and we need a cutoff. That's another thing, eh? because you will see that a lot of biomarkers have been studied, and different studies have actually came, to it, came up with different thresholds for a certain biomarker above which the disease is present or, or not. But just to remind you that also the prevalence is important. Um, sensitivity and specificity is one thing. If the prevalence is, is low, then you may um, have something like this with a high negative predictive value. If the prevalence goes up, then things change. And this is very important to, uh, to consider and to understand when you use tests uh, over, uh, overall. So when we look at bio, when we think of biomarkers, I think PCT and CRP are the tests that we well would, would uh, pop up uh, first. Uh, I think we use them a lot. The question is how useful are they really? I'll try to elaborate a little bit on that. If you look at their characteristics, there well there are some similarities. There's some differences in, in kinetics. Uh, the time to peak concentration is later in uh, CRP compared to uh, PCT. Half life a little bit uh, different and. These characteristics can maybe uh, assist us in, uh, in making uh, uh, decisions, but do mind you that for some of these biomarkers and PCT, there's often false negatives in steroid and immunosuppressed uh, patients, which of course, they, well, we tend to see those patients from time to time in the ICU. 
And also in renal failure, the use of renal replacement therapy actually has quite an impact on the use of biomarkers. And also in patients with liver failure, then for CRP, also uh, significantly impacted. So it's just to show you that there are things that could look helpful, but a lot of the interventions we do in the ICU may impact the uh, uh, biomarkers. So let's look at other biomarkers. And I'm citing um, a few... Um, uh, a few figures from this uh, uh, study, looking at biomarkers for sepsis and focusing on those other than CRP and uh, PCT. Um, there has been quite a, an, an impressive increase in the number of publications in this field, and you can see this uh, here. Uh, and after 2015, actually, it continues to uh, increase. Now, the funny thing is, if you look at the biomarkers that have been studied or the new biomarkers that have been developed and studied, it seems to decrease. So there's somehow there's this, this uh, well of biomarkers has uh, stopped uh, producing, or maybe we just realized that we need to take other uh, approaches. Um, the thing also is that when you look at biomarkers, again, biomarkers other than uh, CRP, and these are um, area under the curves reported uh, in studies that have included more than 300 patients, which I think is a significant sample. And, you know, I think it's hard to say based on studies with 20 patients what a, a, a certain biomarker could mean in clinical practice. But if you would somewhere draw the line at 0 0.8 as uh, having, you know, proper test characteristics, you see that not a lot of these biomarkers actually um, reach that uh, threshold. Mind you also that a lot of the studies that investigated this didn't even report uh, the areas under the curve of their uh, uh, tests. So this is diagnosis. Prognosis, it's even worse. Uh, so is it able to predict mortality? And I'm not saying that these biomarkers do are really bad, but the question is, are they ready for clinical practice? Can we use these in clinical practice? And with these performance characteristics, I think the answer is, is unfortunately no. This led the authors to conclude that, well, a lot of them were uh, used, but only less than a quarter of them were actually better than CRP or uh, PCT, leading them to the conclusion that they have, not been, that they have uh, not been well studied and the clinical role of these biomarkers needs to be better evaluated. So still not enough information despite the hundreds, thousands of patients and millions of uh, euros that have already been invested in research in this uh, area. This comes from another study, again, just showing you the new biomarkers and the older biomarkers. This comes from a study comparing 300 patients um, with um, SIRS criteria. So clinicians were wondering, should we initiate antimicrobials in these patients or not? So really, the clinical situation where you would hope a biomarker is able to distinguish between patients who have SIRS due to infection and SIRS due to something else. Well, you can see that these are the area under the curves reported. What you see, what's just striking is on the right-hand side that the best, the best biomarker was CRP in this, uh, in, in, in this study, and all the other biomarkers were actually not, uh, not very good at discriminating between septic and non-septic uh, SIRS, as the uh, uh, investigators called it. So again, questioning whether these new biomarkers are really the um, uh, solution. I do want to remind you that biomarkers may also create uh, cause harm. Uh, one of them, one, spec one end of the spectrum, we have patients with suspected infection, but the biomarker is low, but still the patient has uh, the uh, infection after all, and especially with PCT, this has been uh, 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 reported. But also intensifying the treatment could mean that actually the patient is harmed. And I just want to cite this study again and remind you of the past study, the Danish study, 1,200 patients that um, uh, were in included uh, that looked at PCT-guided interventions to intensify the treatment. So if PCT was high and it didn't go down enough, right, then the treatment was intensified. And this meant, well, more culturing. Well, this is not very harmful, but of course that could le lead to more antibiotics. More acute diagnostic imaging, CT or whatever the investigator considered, and then extending the antibiotics, uh, adding antibiotics to the, uh, to the treatment. So PCT-guided intensification. More antibiotics were used, mechanical ventilation was prolonged, more higher risk of decreased, uh, glomerul, uh, uh, decreased uh, renal function, prolonged ICU stay, no impact on mortality. Just showing you, because we often assume that using a biomarker in our clinical practice, well, 
if it doesn't do any good, it's probably not harming patients. But if you use these, the, these uh, tests in an irresponsible way, clearly, then you can do harm to your patients uh, as well. Combining biomarkers has been uh, proposed, and well, no big surprise, if you have two poor uh, tests and you bring them together, there's no magic going to happen and all of a sudden make this a, a perfect test. It doesn't help uh, uh, either. So there are a number of challenges, of course, that, that remain. We, we fail to properly diagnose infection and sepsis, of course. That's one important thing. And our patients with pneumonia, well, often we suspect and maybe sometimes the suspicion is a bit higher uh, than uh, in, in other situations, but we fail to adequately diagnose infections. Comorbidities, as I mentioned, um, but also just surgical procedures, for instance, can change biomarkers without, you know, having any uh, causal effect, uh, causal relation with uh, sepsis. Sepsis is a heterogeneous disease. Different sources of infection may need different uh, biomarkers. A lot of the studies have very small sample sizes. Uh, and again, that's a very important consideration when you think of applying this in clinical uh, uh, practice. Failure to consider this test probability, pretest probability is very important, and the use of inappropriate control groups. This is really a very important one when you look at sepsis biomarker research. It's very easy to find a biomarker to discriminate between all of us here in this room and this critically ill patient ventilated on RRT. I mean, any, any biomarker you want to use will be hugely, significantly different. But that's not what we need. We can identify the problem in this patient that I refer to. It's about the patient where you're unsure whether we should initiate antimicrobials uh, that may look very similar to the patient next door with the same clinical question you, you have. And this is a, different, a totally different ballgame. You need to discriminate in two patients that may have um, comorbidities, other diseases, other stuff going on, and that's when it becomes much more challenging. So again, I challenge you, this is a question we have. Does this patient need antimicrobials? Uh, and do we really have a biomarker that helps us here to decide? And I think the answer is, is uh, no. Is it totally worthless? No, I do think that it adds, it gives us additional uh, information, but we need to be aware that probably it's more worth looking at um, serial measurements, uh, albeit with some, some uh, caveats. Uh, and I think biomarkers should never be used as a standalone test. We need to integrate it with uh, other stuff like physical and examination. But the problem is that we forgot about it. We do not do that. We look at a CT scan, we look at a biomarker, and then we miraculously come to a conclusion. I think if you would integrate physical examination, clinical examination with biomarkers, um, then you would already make quite a bit of uh, progress. So this is for me the summary. Clinical context, looking at the patients and looking at trends in biomarkers is probably the best uh, bank for your, uh, for your buck. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I think I do agree that conceptually they remain attractive. Uh, I just think that probably we are missing the complexity of sepsis by trying to reduce this to one single test and one single cutoff, even after this, uh, uh, all of this research that, uh, that uh, has been uh, done. I think we're oversimplifying things, and in ICU, I think that's never good, uh, a good thing. I think we can think of many different situations where we try to reduce the complex organ to one single value, and most of the time, it doesn't really help us forwards. We know where the problem is in research, and of course, we are exploring many different avenues right uh, now. But I do think that they may have a role in clinical management, but only when you would look at trends, serial measurements, and when you integrate them with clinical um, uh, examination, the clinical context. And I really would warn you never to use a biomarker as a sole element in, when making clinical decisions. And with this, I would like to uh, end. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the audience? Antonio, go ahead. Thank you, Jean, for your excellent presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, do we need uh, systemic biomarkers or local biomarkers? Because uh, uh, systemic biomarkers did not reflect exactly uh, the changes in the local organs, for example, in uh, kidney or in lung. What do you 
I think, I think it's fair to say that there, you know, that there, there could be something in, in looking at local biomarkers uh, for sure. But I, essentially, they are faced with the same uh, problem, I think, that we try to reduce a very complex thing to a single, um, a single value. It, it does make sense uh, in a way, but from a clinical perspective, I think at this point, we have no such biomarker, unless I missed one, eh, Antonio, and, and please correct me um, if I'm wrong. But, um, yeah. Uh, they, they, they have been described uh, biomarkers uh, looking at the urine samples, for example. And these reflect uh, more precisely uh, the changes or the inflammatory changes or response in kidney that uh, if you want to compare with uh, systemic uh, biomarkers. Yeah. Exactly the same for the lung. Uh, when you look on the biomarkers in uh, bronchoalveolar lavage, uh, and I think one of the chairmen uh, has more experience than myself, uh, the, give you uh, a more precise information on the treatment response, uh, etc. And I think uh, for the future we need to move uh, yeah. and, uh, and to move from systemic uh, biomarkers to local biomarkers. I think there's, again, I think there's definitely, there's definitely something uh, there, I think, for now. Whether we can use these in clinical practice, I think we're still not there, but this, this is an avenue of research that needs to be continued for, uh, for sure. And are we ready as clinicians to start using these biomarkers, even if they are good? So one study that comes to mind is the VAP Rapid 2 study mm -hmm. that used IL-1 beta and IL-8 in BAL. That's very highly predictive of a bacterial origin of a suspected VAP. And the clinicians were uh, urged to not give antibiotics or to stop the antibiotics if the, if the panel was negative, but they basically did not comply with the protocol and, and kept on prescribing antibiotics to everyone with the negative test, even though the test characteristics are great. Yep. So do you think we can be pursued to ever stop antibiotics or should we look for other indications for a biomarker test? Well, that's more a behavioral sciences uh, conference topic, uh, I think. But you definitely have a, have a point, eh? and when we discuss continuation or discontinuation of antimicrobials later, the same thing will pop up. I mean, the adherence to protocols is not very high in these uh, studies. And is it because we feel that we are much smarter than a biomarker and it is just impossible that a biomarker can you know, can do better than I. So th this could be the, uh, the reason, and maybe it's indeed more our attitude than the performance of, of, the, of the biomarker. So point well taken, even if we have a valid biomarker, are we willing to, you know, leave it to the biomarker alone? Thank you. Could you briefly comment on whether we should more leverage on artificial intelligence to integrate all the biomarkers we already have at the bedside? That's, that's a very hot topic, uh, of course, uh, Gilali, and I, I agree. I think we need, and we are already using, of course, artificial intelligence, especially when it comes to omics, because we, you know, we're just not smart enough. Our, at least my brain is not smart enough to understand all that, the complexity of omics. So are we using that? And this is probably the way to go, whether biomarkers themselves will survive the omics and AA, uh, AI uh, phase, I am not sure. Because for me, I, I think this is just next level. And it doesn't mean that the biomarker research was irrelevant, but it was good at, at that moment in time. We have now more sophisticated tools, again, thinking of what Mervyn just showed us in terms of microbiological diagnostic tools compared to the culture plates. Well, this is a different ballgame. And probably the same holds true for biomarkers. Yeah. Thank you, Jan. We have now to move to the next uh, speaker. Very happy to welcome Julia Wendon from um, King's College Hospitals in London, and she will address uh, one of the most challenging clinical situations, which is trying to recognize sepsis in a failing, in a patient with failing uh, liver. And she will likely provide us with a very optimistic and enthusiastic Totally enthusiastic. Whether we're optimistic on this one, I think is perhaps a mute point, but we shall see. Um, I'm going to talk mainly, well, entirely about liver disease and the role of biomarkers, where the literature is much more limited than in the general ITU population. 
So what do I want as a clinician at the bedside? And what sort of liver disease am I covering this afternoon? I'm going to look a little at acute liver failure. That is rare. It might be hypoxic hepatitis. It might be paracetamol overdose. It might be viral hepatitis. The commonest one is the critically ill cirrhotic or the acute on chronic. And we'll talk about that. And also just a little on post-hepatectomy. What are the biomarkers that we can use in this context? Well, the standard hematological ones, which we'll talk a little about. Uh, PCT, CRP, BDG, newer options, but they're not yet bedside available. And if I'm using a biomarker, I need it to be available to me. I need a rapid turnaround time. And we haven't really taken what's really quite exciting in the laboratory to the bedside yet. And can it realistically separate sterile inflammation, which is very common in liver disease, with bacterial, viral, fungal inflammation? Possibly not. Uh, forward. And I'm really just reiterating, I want it to help me differentiate the problem. I want it to help me make decisions. Will it ever stop me or my colleague giving antimicrobials? Possible. Unlikely. Um, we are human and we need a little bit more nudging than one biomarker. But it might push you in another direction, certainly in liver disease, whether you can transplant someone or not, which you would not want to do in the face of overt bacterial or viral infections. And is it going to help me in terms of prognosis and severity? This, which you've probably seen already, is a really nice review article. It looks at the biomarkers, and I would particularly pull out in regard of this, the chronic liver failure, where your CRP is 70% of normal in this cohort. And in acute liver failure, actually, I use CRP as a marker of regeneration. So when they come in, their CRP will be something like 0 to 5. And as it goes up, you think the liver's regenerating, and that's great. Nothing like a bit of reversing of the standards. PCT, by comparison, is largely not impacted by liver disease. And we'll look at some of the literature on that going through the talk. So in terms of this data, it's quite old, but I think it's still useful. It's looking at procalcitonin and CRP as markers of bacterial infection in cirrhotics. And you can see that for both PCT and CRP, these are probably useful. The areas under the curve you can see at the bottom of the slide, it is quite, quite useful. It's in the 70s and 80s. It's not great, but it gives you an indication that there is infection. But how about when you've got severe acute liver failure? And this is um, data from Ken Wilson's group. If you look at an overarching group of acute liver failure, regardless of etiology, you can see that there really isn't much difference in PCT with sepsis or no sepsis. CRP, similarly, really not significant differences. And the same for white cell count, a bit of a difference, but not great, really not diagnostic clarity. And if you look at just acetaminophen, the most hyperacute of acute liver failure, again, it really isn't desperately helpful. So in acute liver failure, PCT and CRP are not greatly helpful. It comes down to clinical acumen and context. But we can use CRP in post-hepatectomy. And this is some, I think, quite old data, but still nice data, which I use in my day-to-day -day practice, a bit like acute liver failure with the CRP rising being a good sign initially. If you've got a surgeon who's had a small amount of liver removed versus moderate versus severe, you can actually track CRP. So the CRP goes up steadily over time. What's interesting is in those patients that are complicated with high bilirubin, with the development of ascites postoperatively, coagulopathy or encephalopathy, the CRP is suppressed. So 
failure to increase your CRP post liver surgery could be viewed as a poor prognostic sign and a patient who is at risk of infection rather than being reassured. So it really is the reverse of what you would expect. Procalcitonin, if you think about the other liver world, it's the transplanted liver. And in a post-transplant patient, you have inflammation which might be rejection as well as sepsis. And can you separate that? Well, this data again, looking at day one, day two, and day three, would suggest that procalcitonin might be indicative and useful with cutoffs, as you see them there, of nine nanograms per milliliter, but also a total lymphocyte count being used at the same time of 17. So again, it is that integration of data, not a single finding. If you want to look at meta-analyses, again, PCT performs moderately well as a diagnostic tool for post-operative infection, and it's more suited for adult population. So again, you've got a sensitivity of 77%, a specificity which is similar area under the curve of 0.87. You can use it. It shouldn't be the only thing that you look at, though. Precepsin has also been looked at. This data looked at preceptin, PCT, and CRP. You see the areas under the curve, the sensitivity, the specificity, and the predictive values, negative and positive. So can they be used? Yes. But is it really going to help? I'm not convinced. The optimism is falling away, Chairman. I apologize. But again, if you're looking at this sequentially rather than as a standalone value, there is value in it. And precepsin and procalcitonin does seem to be able to diagnose infection in a cirrhotic population. So this is something that maybe we ought to be beginning to look at. But how about going back to the basics? Looking at your eosinophil count. Eosinopenia is associated with sepsis. And this data, looking at cirrhotics, two studies showed very clearly that eosinopenia is a useful modality in nudging you towards, is this a septic diagnosis? Now, in a liver transplant population, that is particularly useful when your PCT's gone up, your CRP's gone up, your white cell count's gone up, and they've got a fever and their AST's gone up. Is it rejection? Is it sepsis? Am I going to biopsy them? Am I going to give them high dose steroids and antibiotics because belt and braces is always good? <coughs> is there anything we can use? Well, possibly, because this data, and although this is the first publication of its nature, subsequently there have been other publications, but eosinophilia is associated with rejection and immune stimulation. So you can use this to diagnose drug reactions, dillies, and also rejection. Is it useful on its own? No. But in clinical context, yes, it is useful. So I still use it. Neutrophil lymphocyte ratios, also useful in diagnosing sepsis in the post-transplant setting. You see here the uh, ratio. Sorry, you can't. I'm going to do it there high for the septic group coming down over time for the non-septic group. So again, these basic parameters should be used perhaps more frequently than some of the others. And this data also from a colleague looking at leukocyte ratios and biomarkers of mortality in sepsis in acute on chronic liver failure, large cohort of patients, and again, neutral lymphocyte ratio coming out strongly, less so the monocyte lymphocyte ratio, but important. But this was done on flow cytometry, not basic laboratory tests. And we don't use that at the bedside yet. I think this is something we need to push for. This is interesting, and it's not been published on much, but fecal calprotectin. When you've got acute and chronic liver failure, your gut is grossly edematous because of portal hypertension. The gut mucosal integrity is lost and you get significant translocation. 
And what these authors looked at, it's not a large study, and that's got to be a warning sign, is fecal calprotectin. And it was interesting because fecal calprotectin really did correlate with sepsis in this study. It needs repeating, and maybe we should look at it more often, even in our general ITU population. But a fecal calprotectin level of greater than 200 was associated with sepsis and sepsis-associated mortality. And integrating all of them, this isn't AI, it's very basic integrative scores. But again, recent study looking at age, temperature, PCT, CRP, lactate, and so far. That pushed you towards infection. And again, it's a useful, really basic bedside test. I'm aware of time, so I'm going to skip this a little, but BDG, be cautious. That's really what I'm going to say. Galaxomannin, really useful in this population. They've got a high risk of fungal sepsis. Galactomannin and BAL galactomannin is useful. BDG, be much more cautious. It's got many confounders and starting or stopping antifungals on one result is ill-advised. And similarly, with BDG, one does just need to be cautious that you should need a gluten-free environment. And there are lots of potential false positives. They're clinically less important than they are in terms of sort of science. But we use albumin all the time in liver patients. And is that why they get a high BDG? And we all say they've got fungal disease. So be cautious is what I would say. And again, it is salient, it is pertinent, they do get fungal disease, but be very cautious in your interpretation and look at serial measurements. I'm just going to skip this because I want to talk a little bit about functional monocyte deactivation. HLADR is really powerful in liver disease. But again, this is something that is flow cytometry based and we haven't yet taken it to the bedside. We need to think of ways of doing so. Similarly, this in alcoholic hepatitis, it's a devastating disease. There's a very high instance of sepsis and once they're in your ITU, they have a very high mortality. Again, using, looking at defective monocyte oxidative burst, you can really see a difference it's quite staggering the effect of alcohol consumption. So these are alcohol-related liver disease abstinent. These are alcohol-related liver disease still drinking. Drinking is bad for you, really sad, but it is. Similarly, severe alcoholic hepatitis, you have much decreased oxidative burst and you therefore have much more viable bacteria. This is something we need to intervene on. It is possible to intervene. We've got to start measuring it and take it to the bedside. And again, just looking at it here, if you look at mono, monocyte oxidative burst in terms of indicator of sepsis, it performs much better than CRP, procalcitonin or white cell count. So something to be considering. And again, there is little cutover, a bit, but much less than for most. Caspases, really interesting because in humans they, and alcohol, I'm sorry, acute on chronic liver failure, there is a separation of caspase 4 and caspase 5. And what's important is that your caspase 4 is downregulated and you see decreased levels of gastermin and interferon. And again, that would be a really powerful biomarker going forward. I'm going to skip these. But monitoring for the future, can we get HLADR to the bedside and this monocyte oxidative burst measurements to the bedside? It's going to take time. But it was really interesting to see this immune profiling panel using Biofire, such that you got a test result that correlated really well with HLADR. And maybe this is where we need to go in the future. So biomarkers, chairman, ladies and gentlemen, lots to measure, a certain lack of sensitivity and specificity and turnaround time, not much new really bedside wise. 
but a great opportunity to really start developing and integrating going forward. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Julia. Your talk is now open for questions or comments from the audience. A waiting one question. Uh, it's the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio uh, looks very interesting uh, and easy to use in practice. Uh, owing to the increasing knowledge about the role of netosis and uh, owing to now the capacity of uh, getting uh, uh, netosis biomarker in the blood, for example, H3.1, uh, levels. Mm. Uh, could you comment on any potential value for these new biomarkers? I think those new biomarkers are paramount going forward. I really do. I think they've got lots of opportunity. And I think what we've got to do is find something that is useful and with rapid turnaround that we can say, this old fashioned one gives me an inkling. I can now move into the next generation. So for me, this is a direction of travel, and we really need that turnaround at all our hospitals, not just the academic centres. Every patient should have the opportunity for these tests. Any other question? May I ask you shortly, you know, the sepsis 3 definition is using lactate levels for septic shock definition. How do you manage it in these uh, cyretic patients? We ignore it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean we ignore it, but they've all got high lactates. They're all tachycardic. They're either hypothermic or hot. You, I cannot for the life of me tell the difference between bacterial infection and sterile infection in this cohort. So um, what, is the, what are the test characteristics? that you would require to not give antibiotics in these patients? Because I, well, I think it's really difficult to not give antibiotics yeah. to a patient that are so severely ill. So I'm going to ask this to every speaker, by the way, but um, so, so I, I shouldn't I, feel that. Yeah, <laughs> so, so I, I, I think if we are ready to study this, we should always keep the clinical question in mind. And if the pretest probability of sepsis is quite high and the negative effects of withholding antibiotics are really high, what is the biomarker that we need to, to withhold antibiotics? Or is there an other reason to have a new biomarker? So I think there are two. I think all of us at the moment, regardless of a biomarker, unless you know, you're approaching 100%, are going to give antibiotics exactly. to a truly sick patient in front of you because the risk of not doing so is so devastating and unforgivable in all yeah. honesty. What I think we need biomarkers for is by day three to be able to say actually the evidence of this being bacterial or fungal is actually really low and I think we should be stopping our antibiotics rather than giving a five, seven, ten day course because antibiotics are not without their side effects. Um, particularly some of the more broad spectrum antimicrobials that we use all the time. So I'm probably obfuscating, but for me it is, we're going to give them antibiotics, but we are then going to really focus on how to stop antibiotics. And yeah, without question, criticising myself, my, the unit I work in, our use of antifungals has gone like that since BDG became rapidly available. So, in line with your saying, the research should be shift toward developing tools to rule out sepsis in these patients, not to try to rule in sepsis, right? And so that, those, that's like the main take home I got from the last three presentations, and also that we need to look at serial measurements rather Absolutely. than single ones, and to not use the fungal uh, diagnostic in this patient yep. group. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor uh, Gia Morelos uh, Bourbolis from uh, Athens in Greece. He will be speaking about bacterial or viral infections, consult the immune response. Uh, and you already know what your questions are you're going to get. So that is uh, very helpful, I think. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the elegant presentation, and I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. And as a matter of fact, you know, when you come across this question,
then all of a sudden you realize that we don't speak about the ICU environment. And I just have to remind you that it, the EasyCam acronym, E, stands for emergencies. So all of a sudden what you have this late afternoon is a presentation about the emergency room and a patient who needs to get or not receive antibiotics in an indirect way. So this is my conflict of interest disclosure for this presentation. I don't have for this specific presentation anything, any conflicts, but allow you to acquaint you a bit with the burden of the problem. So this is very common. A patient who has sore throat and you see there the purulent discharge and the question is that we are discussing about Streptococcus pyogenes or Moraxella or Staph aureus or viruses, but okay. Allow me to be a bit more specific. We are at the winter season. We have a patient with a medical history of COPD, and all of a sudden the patient has expectoration, which is not really purulent, and he has ha cough, and this is a chest x-ray full of question marks. And then the question comes, do you know, actually, since you measured about ruling out the negative predictive value of Antonisin's criteria for this patient is roughly 30%. So you can not use them. And all of a sudden, Antonisin can tell you whether you are in front of a viral exacerbation of COPD, streptococcus, pneumonia, you have haemophilus influenza, or even mycoplasma. So the answer to the question is translation what translation is about. Let's envisage that we have a viral infection and all of a sudden from liver cup for cells, there is a signal of IL-1 to hepatocytes and this they give rise to C-reactive protein. This is easy. Everybody will tell you that C-reactive protein is increased when it is for a bacterial infection. Yes, but what increase means? You need to define a cutoff, a concentration, Increase does not mean above normal. It means above a certain level. Let's put it a different way. You have a viral infection. And because you have a viral infection, interferon alpha exactly stimulates tissue macrophages, and this gives way to production of IP10, or CXCL10 interferon gamma induced protein. Again, increase or a certain cutoff of increase. And imagine a patient who has influenza or who has another viral infection, rhinovirus, and on top of this, the patient has bacterial infection. So all of a sudden, you need a judge, a judge to tell you we are towards the bacterial arm or we have two viruses, one next to the other, and the judge could well be trail. And here is the artificial intelligence tool that Professor Anane asked already. And actually, this is manufactured nowadays using whole blood. So it's a point of care device for the emergency room. There is no need of preparation or certification or whatever. And in 15 minutes, you have this bar, which is telling you, you have a score, a score which integrates the concentrations of these three so we don't have plus minus anymore. We have the concentrations of these three. And if the score is, the more it's towards 100, the more is the likelihood and above 90, it also becomes a certainty to have a bacterial infection. The more you are towards zero and below 10, it's a certainty to be viral infection and the rest are in between. But the important stuff is that if a patient has viral or bacterial infection, the judge allows to bring measurements above 80 so that the patient is not missing the antibiotics he's in need of. So allow me to start different studies. Here we need to be specific. These are studies. They're not trials. And we have children, we have adults, the majority with respiratory tract infections, many of them with fever, and all these studies, they work in need of adjudicators. This is something very important because for all these studies, in order to understand their validity, you need to understand what is the gold standard. And the gold standard is that you need at least two people to whom you deliver the entire patient file 
without your opinion on the diagnosis. You, the only thing that you hide from them is the test under study. And they need to vouch and tell you, is it high possibility for bacterial infection, low possibility, high possibility for viral, low possibility? And then the question comes, if the two adjudicators, they agree, everything is okay. But if the adjudicators, they disagree, what is your gold standard? And here is, by using as gold standard, the common decision of adjudicators for bacterial and viral infection, that indeed CRP is, in, is much more increased. But look at here. All the dots that you see are single patients. And not all patients have the same value. Not all patients have the same concentration. But yet, CRP is higher in bacterial, IP10 is higher in viral, and the overall host response is the BV score is higher when it comes to bacterial infection. Let's move along to the autopilot DX study in children where comparisons are done with multiplex uh, PCR. Again, the adjudicators are there. And you see that there is a cutoff of the score, a cutoff of 0.1 for procalcitonin, a cutoff of 20 for CRP favoring bacterial infection, and you may see that sensitivity and specificity is favoring the BV score. The same is for PPV and NPV over the comparators. And then all of a sudden a hypothesis. If we could have used that in a trial, would it have been possible to avoid antibiotics? The answer is yes. Which antibiotics? In roughly 30% of our patients. Betalact and betalactamase inhibitors, quinolones, clindamycin, and macrolides is the answer. Now let's move to a study in adults, patients, 415 patients with respiratory tract infections, and the experts, again, the judge for bacterial, viral, and determined infections, and we compare that to CRP and procalcitonin, and again, the biomarker is superior. The important thing here is that in all patients who all of them were suffering from upper respiratory tract infections, there is comparison to Barfar filmare, and so there is an association with the type of the pathogen, which in all cases demonstrates that when you come across a viral infection, the score is lower compared to bacterial infection. But now allow me to bring you to another field. Let's take e each of these elements separately. And let's go to IP10, which, as I elaborated earlier on, is a marker of viral infection. And let's use two cohorts of patients. One cohort, which is the discovery set. These are patients from our COVID study, Save More, which was the registration trial for Anakinra, and the phase two study, Save as a validation cohort. And as a matter of fact, you see that all patients who end up with unfavorable prognosis, meaning they end up in the ventilator or they die the first 14 days, they have higher concentrations of IP10. And here, going back to your question, what I want in case when I want to predict an unfavorable outcome, high sensitivity, high negative predictive value, but you see that if you go into this, how low the positive predictive value goes. But with this, you see that the patient who have a concentration of IP10, more than 2,000, they have a likelihood of 30% to end up in the ventilator or die the first 14 days, compared to only 3.4% of patients with such a low concentration. So, the question comes, is this a driver for an Akinra treatment? The answer is yes. As a matter of fact, in the original trial, we used as uh, a selection tool the biomarker SUPAR, the odds ratio of anakinra efficacy by using SUPAR was 0.36, here is 0.33. And if you move to the validation cohort, you see that in all cases, a high IP10 demonstrates a high likelihood for unfavorable outcome. And you know, several times, you, as a researcher, you come up to the concern 
okay, but these are results only coming from my studies. I would feel much more happy if there would be an independent study who would vouch exactly the same findings. And we were very happy that there is a study coming from two emergency rooms from Israel, from the COVID-19 period, and also from Germany and from the United States, showing that very early at the emergency department, the IP10 is much higher in patients who will get unfavorable prognosis. And as a matter of fact, look at that. It is a type of signature for the host. Even after three days, after seven days, after 14 days, the signature is there and the score tells you that there will be an unfavorable outcome. Here are data that we present later uh, today at uh, 6 p.m. during the poster session from a study that we conducted in three emergency departments uh, in Greece, patients with respiratory tract infections starting less than seven days. And actually, our question was, we ask our collaborators at the emergency room, we trained you for the VB score, how to interpret that? Now the patient comes, decide based on what you use so far, whether you will give to him or not antibiotics. And then we come back to the physicians and we tell them, look at the BV score. Will you change or not your decision? So this is the question before he knows the BV score. And this is the question after he knows the BV score. And look what happened. Indeed, some of the physicians, they change their minds. And in those who change their minds, they change that just because the BV score was higher. And as a matter of fact, with this approach, indeed, we managed to have a surveillance of antibiotics. In the few minutes which uh, remain to end my talk, I would like also to uh, discuss about another approach. Already we presented IL-6 leading to CRP and which vouch for bacterial infection. But interference by acting either on immune cells or respiratory tract cells, they may give production to maxo maxovirus resistant protein A also with the acronym MEX-A. These are cohorts coming from Greece and the adjudicators using also microbiology findings they limited our investigation in the aim to differentiate between definitive viral infection and definitive bacterial infection. And these are the concentrations in blue of MEX-A in red of CRP. And it's striking that in the case of viral infection, MEX-A is increased. In case of bacterial infection, uh, CRP is increased. And so we were in need of an artificial intelligence tool, which elaborated an equation and also a probability. And if the probability was more than 0.5, or if the ratio of max A to CRP was less than two, all of a sudden this sensitivity for diagnosis of bacterial infection goes above 90% and the negative predictive value also follows above 90%. So I will end up with uh, a conclusion similar to uh, Mervyn Singer that the future is here or it has already arrived. It's focusing mainly on respiratory tract infections. Why? Because this is the field where we are in need of surveillance of antibiotics and this is where most of overconsumption of antibiotics takes place. The existing studies, they are, the evidence is much more for children and less for adults. The idea is to discriminate between bacterial and viral infection in order to guide antibiotic prescription. From the main platforms which are available, most of evidence exists for the BV score, which provides higher specificity and sensitivity than CRP and procalcitonin. It is impressive that IP10 is an element which may predict early and favorable outcome of COVID-19, but 
we need to take two main things into consideration as main limitations. That there are no randomized controlled trials. The use of these tools to restrict antibiotics is something that we hope this may come. And we need always to remember that there is only one biomarker for which randomized controlled evidence is available for respiratory infections in the outpatient department, and this is procalcitonin. And these new tools can only be used from the moment they reach the quality of the evidence which has already been published for procalcitonin. Thank you so much for your attention. Very persuasive presentation. Thank you. Thank you. People in the audience with questions or comments. Yeah. So outside, outside of a randomized control trial, would you advise people should or shouldn't use this modality to guide their treatment? With the current approach and with the current evidence, if we would use the old uh, grade system, which is not, let's say, the uh, situation anymore, someone would say that uh, the use is between level 2A and 2B. In order to have a 1A or 1B level of evidence for the use and to guide antibiotic prescription for respiratory tract infections, we are in need of at least two randomized controlled trials pointing towards the, sh the same direction. With this in mind, in my hospital and the emergency room, even though we have availability of these tools, I still consult procalcitonin <coughs> to answer that question because this is the only biomarker for which there is randomized control evidence. More questions? So, the, these studies are, of course, needed comparing a uh, biomarker to guided therapy versus standard of care or procalcitonin guided therapy. Uh, and I'm sure you're going to do it. Um, <laughs> so what are going to be the important endpoints here? Is it a reduction in antibiotic use? Is it um, patient-centered outcomes? What, what is the goal of the tests in such a study? Uh, by definition, uh, such a study cannot be done in, uh, designed in a similar way as it was done before 2010, because something that you mentioned at uh, very important is that at that time the Infectious Disease Society of America did not introduce the respiratory severity symptom score, which is very important and which is considered now the standard outcome the first 72 hours, particularly for low respiratory tract infections. So I would uh, favor a composite primary outcome, which takes into consideration restriction of antibiotics, but also the intensity of the symptoms of the patient. And there is no doubt that the key secondary endpoint should be safety and mortality. Perfect. So it's one, one part of the outcome is good for society, a reduction in antibiotics, and the other one is making sure that the patients are not harmed. Perfect. So maybe Evangelos, uh, do we know how previous treatment, for example, most of patients coming in the ER for suspected infection already got antibiotics uh, by their GPs for a couple of days, or there might be COPD patients receiving inhaled corticosteroids. So do we know how these previous treatment may interact and influence these uh, biomarkers? Well, thank you very much. Uh, something also that uh, I did not have time to elaborate is that if you look at the exclusion criteria of most of these studies, uh, recent intake of antibiotics is an exclusion criteria. So with this in mind and taking into consideration what Juve asked about uh, the design of a trial, if I would design a trial in an academic perspective without any industrial involvement, I would not limit, I would go for all the patients. Because if a patient has received antibiotic and his problem persists, there is no doubt that if the tool is adjunctive to our decision, it should go beyond this limitation. 
<coughs> Thank you, Evangelist, for the I purpose of oh, <laughs> one quick short question, please. Yes, go ahead. Combined, thank you. Combined biomarkers are, are have higher I, AUCs for sepsis. Would you extend uh, the study design to sepsis patients uh, versus other hyperinflammation patients, uh, say um, pancreatitis, burns, trauma, uh, in order not to prescribe antibiotics? I don't believe that these tools, both of them that I presented, may act as sepsis diagnostic tools. However, uh, if you look at the entire publications, their big advantage is that they may predict outcome. So in other terms, for patients who do not have already developed clinical signs of severity, they may predict what will happen the next 14 days. So I believe that the real value of this test is that they need to be positioned in another setting, in other terms, how their predictive performance can be coupled with an action which will prevent the unfavorable outcome. Thank you, Evangelist. Let's move on to the next speaker. Um, um, it's my pleasure to welcome to the podium Ed Schenk, who is coming from Well Cornell School of Medicine and New York Presbyterian Hospital. He's going to talk about genomic damage in sepsis. Yes, uh, thanks very much. I feel like, uh, well, first of all, thank you everyone for staying so late into the afternoon with a gorgeous sunset in the background. And, and uh, hopefully we, I can entertain you during this talk. It's going to be a little bit different than the previous talks because mine is a little bit more preclinical in focus, but hopefully you can share my enthusiasm about the potential for this methodology. So no AUC questions, please. <laughs> All right, so these are my disclosures, nothing relevant for this talk. So conce conceptually, biomarkers in critical care can be thought of as a, as a way to mechanistically especially as we're moving through some of our, our talks here, um, try to attack the problem of why so many clinical trials in um, critical care medicine has failed. And this concept originally um, kind of coined by uh, a cancer biologist by the name of Sidney Brenner, um, just in, a, in an interview um, called reverse translation, takes the, the formal um, mouse to target to therapy to patient paradigm and changes it. And it brings the patient at the center of the paradigm and with data directly at the bedside gathered and with um, translational um, science performed, informs why the therapy may or may not have worked, gives new um, hypotheses for mechanism, and from there can inform how we should change our thinking about the target. And so examples of these types of reverse translations with biomarkers in sepsis and, and critical care medicine include things that you are um, familiar with, omics, for example. So in the left panel, this is um, an example of transcriptomics from a secondary analysis, analysis of the VANISH um, critical trial looking at um, uh, vasopressin and its use combined with um, steroids and looking at differential leukocyte transcription and also together in the same cohort you can see on the right panel doing proteomics and you're seeing differing clusters of biomarkers either um, higher or lower and patients being grouped in different um, ways and then this feeds back to the idea that there are hypotheses that can be generated from these different analyses. And you can move on to other types of concepts like, um, for example, metagenomics that was already mentioned a few times. And so this is looking at the to totality of the um, genomic signatures within the bloodstream and characterizing um, the microbial burden. Um, and so this is a, a complex study, but it's looking at um, whether inflammatory or, or kind of pseudoproteomic um, derived phenotypes can be correlated with microbial abundance in the same samples. And so looking at the idea that there's relative pathogen um, abundance and, um, and dominance that um, relates to um, different types of omic outcomes. And there's some 
early patient-centered results from these concepts, which is the idea that if you have a transcriptomic response, this is again the VANISH trial, um, looking at uh, a transcriptomic response of leukocytes, that you can stratify patients into differing kind of innate or adaptive immune response phenotypes and retrospectively um, characterize whether or not there is a signal of harm with exposure to corticosteroids. And when you think about the immune response, this is where our work um, comes into play. It's the idea that when you're transitioning from the innate immune response on the left side of the screen, is that the, the idea that the innate immune response with antigen presenting cells kind of harnessing the um, innate immune system and then coordinating an adaptive immune response is that in order to coordinate this, that immune co-stimulation is required. And so pathogen associated molecular patterns like LPS, um, and viral RNA and DNA fragments, in addition to damage-associated molecular patterns like HMGB1, mitochondrial DNA, and cell-free DNA, act as these immune adjuvants and are part of the story of how the innate and adaptive immune system communicate to each other. Another sidestep is the idea that um, in COVID-19, at least, this was an extremely early kind of um, cartoon that described the viral host response phase and the inflammatory host response phase that followed the natural pattern. We know this cartoon is not true, um, but it did create a paradigm that at least to some degree um, fit with the clinical response we saw in some clinical trials, which is that when you look at recovery dexamethasone, for example, all, all the patients, there's a small benefit on the left-hand side of the screen in the patients who do not have oxygen, so they're still in the viral phase, hypothetically, that there is harm from administration of dexamethasone, and the patients who are on oxygen or on invasive mechanical ven ventilation derive more of a benefit because there's more of that um, host response phase. Additionally, the, the viral load predicted outcome. So this is the copy number assessed in the, um, just by the nasal pharyngeal swab, um, can correlate with the, the abundance of the virus within the system, um, which is the idea that the microbial burden is potentially a, a valuable target as well. And so some questions that follow potentially are how do we quantitatively evaluate um, the burden of cell death, that cell is a typo on the top there, and what cells and tissues are involved if there is cell death um, within um, uh, the host? And can a similar methodology that the same samples, samples be used to assess infectious agents within the plasma at the same time? And so in order to attack this question, we, we get back to the idea that DNA is, um, is measurable within the plasma. This is the first description of DNA fragments and anti-nuclear anti antibodies um, discovered back in 1966 in patients with lupus. For example, you see the precipitin lines of, of the of complement um, being fix, fixed by the antibodies binding to DNA in the patients in the SLE serum. And fast forward a little bit more um, that you know people led by actually investigators in Europe have, have looked at the idea that cell-free DNA is a generalized biomarker of injury. So cell-free DNA is small fragments of DNA that are detectable within the bloodstream. And these fragments measured with different mechanisms in each of these studies, um, basically the higher severity of illness, the more cell-free DNA is present within um, the bloodstream. And this has been repeatedly evaluated in trauma and sepsis and in different um, other critical care conditions. Trajectory of cell-free DNA may be important. This is a prospective study that's a little bit more recent. You see the differ differential um, values within sepsis patients and trauma patients, but you also see that the failure for cell-free DNA to fall is potentially associated with outcome. But so what? Injured cells and tissues release cell-free DNA. Is it just detritus of cell death? Is there anything else that we can figure out um, by assessing this um, this, this novel, relatively bio, bio, novel biomarker. And so in order to address this question, we have to be thinking about other ways that cell-free DNA can give us information. And so this, very early in the, in the transplant world, it was the idea that if you can measure DNA within the plasma, you can ask questions of it. So the very simple question is if you had a stem cell transplant that got a, a donor gender mismatch, you could quantify the relative frequency of the Y chromosome within the cell-free DNA to very quickly assess 
how much um, chimerism there is just on a peripheral sample instead of doing a bone marrow biopsy. Fast forward a little bit um, further in time, and then you can assess the burden. Uh, if you make a map of your donor um, single nucleotide polymorphisms, and then assess the presence of those polymorphisms within the blood, blood of a transplant recipient, you can assess how likely they are to be experiencing rejection. So the amount uh, for a solid organ. And then the, the, the final um, kind of conceptual breakthrough is the idea of looking at not only self, non-self for DNA, it's the idea is within the self, can you deconvolute the tissue of origin of your cell-free DNA? So there's a couple different methods of doing this. This is nucleosome mapping, so an epigenetic mar marcher, marker that can, has relative specificity for things like cancer, um, relative specificity for differing tissue con um, contributions. But really, the most effective way to deconvolute tissue of origin has to do with methylation patterns. And so this is uh, an old technology, but basically you, you in, induce a bisulfite bot uh, modification to genomic DNA, which transfers unmethylated cytosine to uracil. The methylated cytosine is not reactive. And then you amplify the total sample with PCR. And all of the uracils and thymine residuals that have been amplified as thiamine, and only the methylated cytosine will not be uh, um, amplified in this way. This is another cartoon showing the same um, method. And so you can, you, there are specific patterns of meth methylation that have been traced with using the 110 reference genomes by this um, epi epigenomics consortium um, back in the 2010s, published in Nature in, in 2015, where you can, with relative um, specificity, identify when there's a fragment of DNA Given its methylation pattern, you can um, associate that back to the tissue of origin based on these reference genomes. And so with the reference, um, the, these mapping available, we have a technique called SIFT-seq, which is a little bit technical. It's led by um, uh, Eugene de Vlamic, um, who's actually Belgium, um, but he works at, uh, in Cornell main campus as a um, geneticist together with his PhD student, Omari uh, Zava where you do your bisulfite treatment early when you get the, uh, your sample, because one of the biggest problems when you're doing any sort of um, metagenomic analysis is the presence of contamination. And when, if you, you do your tagging early and you create your methylation pattern before the rest of your sample preparation, you can reduce the burden of, of, of um, contamination. And so our, this is the way our study um, and some preliminary idea um, data that we have is within our ICU population with this, with so far this, I'm gonna show you samples of 50 kind of extant sepsis patients who have already been treated with antibiotics in the emergency department. They are day one and a half of their ICU where they get samples collected um, together with ICU controls. And then the, the, this methodology is applied and we do um, pathogen detection and cell, cell types of origin deconvolution. And this is the results for the fractions of cell type of origin. It's a very busy slide. There's a couple of colors that jump out. Each color represents a relative fraction of a tissue of origin. Any guesses as to the green? It's granulocyte. So in sepsis patients, the most common uh, tissue of origin by fraction is granulocyte, as um, Dr. Anane had mentioned with the um, netosis uh, as, a, as, a, as a link in that. Uh, but there's a lot of variability. Some patients, have, this is fraction on the y-axis. These are differing solid organs on the x-axis. So some patients have a relatively high proportion of their cell-free DNA that's actually from solid organs. Like liver, for example, there's a high um, variability in the, in the relative um, um, fraction of the derived cell-free DNA. But you can see the other organs like kidney, heart, brain, and pancreas all contribute, especially in, this, in sepsis with organ dysfunction. And then um, looking at endothelial cells too, they also take up a, 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 pro, a high relative abundance in certain sepsis patients. Whereas, as I mentioned before, that green population, the most common by far is granulocyte for um, derived cell-free DNA. 
And this is an example of what that early treatment with uh, bisulfite bonding can do to your microbial abundance. So on the left is without the CIF-seq treatment. So without that additional step, you can see that you can get detectable levels of all manner of pathogens and um, differing um, non-pathogenic bacteria within your sample. This is much reduced um, with, the, with this additional step. And keep in mind, this is three days after two days after to three days after administration of antimicrobials, we still get concordance um, with the original cultured um, bacteria that is usually no longer culturable um, at the time of sample collection. So the, the signal persists much longer within the bloodstream. And the abundance matches uh, sepsis. So even though that this is day three-ish into their sepsis course after antibiotics, you still see higher abundance in sepsis patients and you also see lower diversity. So in summary, tissue of origin analysis may offer insight into the relative burden of cell death in a given disease state with many caveats. We may be able to identify truly exuberant cell death phenotypes in sepsis and quantitative metagenomics may allow for more rapid assessment of infections and could be a new target for therapeutics because of its quantitative nature. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. <clears throat> so, any comment or question in the room? So, we're waiting for, for questions from the room. <clears throat> uh, do we know how aging is influencing the, 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 the proportion of uh, patients having positive DNA detected in the blood, for example? Uh, so, uh, I, I personally don't, um, but cell-free DNA is a very sensitive um, assessment, mm -hmm. and the, the level, the quantification of normals and the quantification of a little bit of stress is, needs to be established. Um, because when you have healthy controls, if they're from young people versus um, older, older people, that will, that will be important. So it, the pathway to actual use as a biomarker is still a long way off. So you find all kind of DNA from, from different tissues in the blood. Is there any way to relate that to organ failures, for example? Um, that would be an interesting approach to, to this topic. Correct. Um, I mean, that's exactly what we were planning on doing. Um, as next steps is the, the idea that, what, for instance, the debate of whether you have kidney quiescence versus kidney parenchymal injury is, is the actual DNA um, detectable within the blood. Does that correlate with some sort of prolonged renal failure versus a transient change in your, uh, in your creatinine? <clears throat> and do we know if there is some correlation in, in between the type of cell death and the level of DNA, because you know, cell may die for many pathways. Yeah. Okay, so for example, uh, uh, neutrophils may sacrifice themselves as a physiological normal response to kill a bacteria. Right. Yeah. So, so netosis itself, you know, even even before the actual lysis of the neutrophil, the neutrophil is extruding its DNA fragments as a, as a net in order to capture bacteria and initiate microbial killing. Um, and so not all of this cellular of this DNA fragments is actually due to death, um, first of all. Um, and second of all, you know, when you're looking at a blood marker, the, your relative burden of you know, apoptosis throughout the body, you know, necroptosis, which is an area of cell death that I'm interested in, it will be a little bit difficult <laughs> to really say whether or not in different tissues at different times they're what the burden is um, because of your sampling the plasma. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank All right, you thank very much. You. We're going to move on to the next speaker. Uh, that's Andrew Shaw. Yeah. Thank you. Um, with uh, who's going to present about novel sepsis markers. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> and again, I'd also echo the last speaker's uh, congratulations for your sturdiness and hardiness to stay. <clears throat> I actually get the better view of the sunset from this angle, so you don't know what you're missing. So what I'm going to do in the next 15 minutes is 
share with you some data from a recent prospective observational study we completed in the US looking at a novel uh, biomarker for sepsis, which is already available here in Europe. Uh, there are my disclosures. Uh, and the dilemma I think we've talked about to a great degree already. We have a huge prevalence of sepsis. Sorting out what is sepsis from what is not is challenging. Even for well-established master clinicians, many of us in the room often face this challenge. Certain populations, it's a major challenge, as was alluded to when we deal with cirrhotics. Uh, and we know that early intervention is key, right? Missing the sepsis patient on the floor who languishes is a pathway to disaster. But conversely, if your hospital is like my hospital and you have an EMR, my EMR triggers the sepsis alert every time someone sneezes. And I'm exaggerating there, but it really leads to an extensive abuse of resources that are very limited, ranging from nurses who are brought to bear for that patient, and of course, antimicrobials. And as we've discussed already, antimicrobial resistance is a challenge we face every day. Why biomarkers? Because we're searching for that objective measure, that green light to pat us on the back to help us confirm our decision. It's not meant to replace clinical judgment. Right? It's not meant to replace years of master clinician kind of work, but it's there to be part of that assessment and to help you, especially as we have more and more protocols in busy, complicated hospitals, to guide initial care. So what do we know about pancreatic stone protein, which is what I'm going to be discussing? Uh, it was originally discovered in 1990. Uh, it's a medium-sized kind of lectin protein, uh, and it's a remote damage-sensing protein. It's kind of interesting. Uh, the pancreas is plugged into things in a way that many people don't understand, and when there is organ and tissue injury elsewhere in the body, the pancreas gets involved, even if it looks biochemically normal to us. Uh, and pancreatic stone protein is actually also overexpressed when you have TNF-alpha around, which, of course, is part of the evil humors of sepsis. And this diagram just kind of illustrates things. Again, you can have a pneumonia or trauma injury to the, the, the lungs. That leads to the remote sensing of organ by the remote, remote sensing of the damage by the organ in the pancreas and the release of PSP, which may serve some biological role that's unclear in terms of further neutrophil activation. What do we know previously? Uh, this is one study. There have been many. This was done about a decade ago. Uh, this is looking at patients just randomly in your intensive care unit, measuring a PSP, and then determining whether they had sepsis or not. It wasn't based on a clinical suspicion of sepsis, which I think is important. That's a, a very different thing, right? When we talk about a clinical suspicion of sepsis, you have some pretest probability in your mind. Uh, they measured PSP and other biomarkers. They looked at severity of illness and the presence or absence of sepsis. You can see there in the table how PSP performed, especially versus other markers that we also have. And this is some more data from the study. Uh, the figure on the left shows very nicely that as severity of illness increases, PSP levels went up. And similarly, the uh, uh, ROC curve shows how PSP confirmed uh, versus other available diagnostics at the time that study was done. So that brings me to the current study, which I want to share with you today. This was a study done in the United States at six sites prospectively. The patients were clinically suspected of having sepsis by the investigator. Right, so these are master investigator clinicians. Patient was suspected of having sepsis. They were either already in the ICU or in the emergency department and expected to come to the ICU. There were certain exclusion criteria that we can talk about in a little bit. The measurement of the PSP was done with this novel uh, rapid diagnostic, uh, the abioscope. Uh, and of course, this study was sponsored by Abionic, which makes this. They also had a CRP measured concurrently. Now, remember, in the United States, we don't routinely rely on CRP for much of anything in the hospital. So understand that we have a very different paradigm about how we think about biomarkers already uh, versus how things might be thought about in Europe. And the diagnosis of sepsis within uh, 48 hours or septic shock served as the primary endpoint. Uh, how was the diagnosis of sepsis made? Uh, I heard earlier that there were two adjudicators in one study. This was a blinded three adjudicator panel that looked at the case. Uh, they all came to a conclusion based on the records, of course, blinded to the PSP and blinded to the other adjudicators' opinions. They had the complete record there available. Uh, and if the panel was not unanimous, it wasn't best two out of three, it had to be a unanimous decision, uh, then the panel met openly to discuss the case and come to a resolution. Uh, the, kappa correla the correlation among the three adjudicators in a blinded fashion initially was at 85% or better. So they were pretty uh, concordant overall. <clears throat> 
Uh, there were two study populations that we looked at uh, for analytic purposes. There's the primary study population, which is going to be a group of people who didn't meet the exclusion criteria that are listed there. And then the secondary population is everyone enrolled. Because I agree very much with the speaker who uh, spoke about the other issues, which is we have things that are done for regulatory issues as part of what's done for registration uh, with U.S. or European regulatory authorities. I don't get to exclude those people at the bedside. I don't get to say, nope, you didn't meet entry criteria for this diagnostic question, so I still have to make a decision. So we looked at all those people who would have been excluded because of those techni technical issues and did a secondary analysis with all of them. Again, we looked at a pre-specified diagnostic criteria for, for sepsis based on the biomarker. It was a level above 200. We developed sensitivity specificity ROC curves, and we also looked at combining things because we've talked a lot about biomarkers in isolation, but again, just as we all integrate lots of pieces of information, the question is, can we integrate other biomarkers that are easily and readily available to enhance the accuracy of our assessments? So we looked not only at PSP alone, but we looked at an elevated PSP and also an elevated CRP at the same time. Here's the patient flow. Initially, 544 patients across six sites were screened. Uh, about 500 were eligible, and you can see where there were the screen failures and other things. 100 fell out, basically, for the reasons of the exclusion about the technical issues that go in the package insert, such as, you know, they had an aspiration event, so do they really meet criteria for sepsis, or how do you sort, sort it out? They had an isolated viral infection, they were abdominal surgery patients, what have you. But again, you'll see all that data from those patients in the population that's the secondary analysis. What do we know about these people? Uh, predominantly a Caucasian and male population, uh, but a relatively sick population. Uh, and not surprisingly, the sepsis patients who are about 45% of the population more likely to be on vasopressors. Small number of them were on mechanical ventilation at first, but the sepsis patients had SOFA scores of eight versus the non-sepsis patients having SOFA scores of three. And you can see the primary reasons for ICU admission there listed as well. So in terms of generalizability, I really think this population reflects what I see as a challenge when I'm evaluating patients either at a rapid response on the floor or in the emergency department or even a patient who's been in the ICU and I might be think, worried about them developing sepsis. Uh, and if you look at, the, this is the primary population, if you looked at the secondary population, figure's not much different. What is the actual incidence of sepsis? There on the left, you see it in the primary analysis population, it's 46% about almost half in the entire population. But what's striking is you look across the x-axis our various PSP levels, and you can see there's a strong correlation between PSP and the prevalence of sepsis, which is shown on the y-axis. So there's this strong relationship, and the point is to understand that this is not something that doesn't have some biological hypothesis or plausibility behind it to justify looking at this protein and biomarker potentially. How did the assay do? You can see the screening characteristics in the primary analysis population and the entire uh, population. Sensitivity, 60 and 55% respectively. Specificity, much better, 82 and 74%. Um, again, looking at negative predictive values in about the 70% range and overall accuracy, you know, true positives and false negatives added up overall, about 80%. Uh, and you can see the difference in the positive and negative likelihood ratios. Here are the ROC curves, just to kind of look at things. Again, we picked 200 as the uh, threshold for a positive versus a negative test. When you look at the ROC curves, it's actually not 200, but 200 is what was pre-specified. It's about 157 uh, in the uh, primary analysis population, 117 in the entire population of about 400 people. And you can see how the sensitivity and specificities uh, change with that. What happens when you combine it with CRP? So there on the table, uh, again, you can see what's going on with the PSP alone, which I showed you. And again, the median PSP levels were substantially higher in septic patients. And not surprisingly, the median CRP levels were higher in septic patients. Okay, we know this. If you combine them, if you now look at the far right column, you can see the sensitivity and sensitivity go up substantially. Specificity, you don't pay a penalty by combining them, right? That's the key. Oftentimes when we use A and B, we pay a price for that change. There was no price that was paid. The, the addition of the two assays was actually picking up patients that were not picked up initially. And again, you can see what happens to the negative, uh, positive and negative predictive value, how the accuracy goes up, and how the likelihoods ratio changes. And here's just the uh, AUC, ROC, ROC AUC curve for that. And here, the area under the curve goes up to you know, 0.85 almost, which is pretty damn good for a combination of two tests. You know, I know the question was asked, what's the threshold by which you would withhold something? 
Again, I think that all depends on how you're going to integrate what's going on with the patient at the bedside. If someone's crashing and burning in front of you, are you going to withhold antibiotics? Probably not, right? Because you don't have enough information and you know what the cost is of getting it wrong, right? Because it's not only about positive or negative predictive value, it's about the cost of a false choice, right? It's not, you know, if there's no harm to giving an extra liter of fluid because you think the patient's getting septic, then you'll do it. If the patient's teetering on the brink of mechanical ventilation, you might feel differently. Right? And so the point is, uh, although our, our, our moderators raised this question, I want to push back and say, in one sense, it's an actual false choice. Because it's not only what the sensitivity and specificity are, or the positive and negative predictive values by which you would make a decision, it's what are the costs of making a bad decision. And that needs to be integrated in that. And no test or study like this is ever going to answer that question for you at the bedside. So what are the take home messages? First of all, I think it's pretty clear that PSP represents a novel and now easily measured point of care assay. Uh, and I think that's fascinating because a number of the assays that have been used in the past are not point of care. Uh, it can be applied either as an inclusionary or exclusionary test. And you have to decide what's the more important question at that point for that patient. Again, I think from a US perspective, there's a lot of uh, emphasis that's placed on exclusionary issues. Because again, in the US right now, the federal government has quality metrics for sepsis, and you have to bring certain things to bear in terms of bundles of care. And so things are done reflexively and often without thought just to check a box on a protocol. And again, if I have a sepsis response nurse in my thousand bed hospital who has to run every time an EMR alert triggers, if I can now add something to that that says, hold on, this isn't a priority, this isn't likely something you need to be involved with, it's just important to do, illustrate that as well. Um, and remember, of course, in this study, you've got excellent master clinicians and their ability was less than a coin toss at making a diagnosis, right? So again, perhaps if we think about the words of the poet Robert Frost, we have miles to go before we sleep. So we certainly as clinicians need assistance. And uh, clearly I also think future analyses are warranted looking at this. There have been studies done in Europe looking at it as a serial marker over time. And of course that enhances its accuracy. Uh, there are things that show that it correlates very well with severity of illness as has been shown with other biomarkers. But the issue becomes, how do you want to use this, right? Do you want to look at it in a population that's very challenging to sort out if they're, you know, septic or not and validated in a burn population? Do you want to use it more broadly, as I discussed? When you talk to people, they all have their own unmet need. And I think the question for all of us is to grapple with this data to figure out how to apply it at the bedside to address those unmet needs. Because that's the only way I know to improve outcomes. Uh, for sepsis, for a long time, we practiced a lot of vehemence-based medicine. The whoever said it loudest thought they were right. Fortunately, because of a lot of people in this room, we're at an era of evidence-based medicine that's really improved outcomes. And so I think it's our burden and our responsibility to grapple with all the evidence, some of which I've shown you today, some of which has been shown by other speakers, and figure out how to apply it at the bedside. Thanks so much. A lot of questions from the audience. Antonio. Antonio, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, what was the performance of PS PSP uh, according to the different uh, infection, source infections? So, the, so if you didn't hear the question, it's how did PSP vary based on whether it was a pneumonia, a bloodstream infection, or again, the site infection? That data exists. We have not analyzed it yet. So that, that's on top of mind to get that out there as well, because I think that's a very important question. And, and the same for the nosocomial sepsis and or the uh, community acquired sepsis? So most of these patients had community onset infection. Uh, about 20% of them were nosocomial, as I recall, but I'd have to go back and check. Uh, the, there's a lot of experience with this in nosocomial infection in the ICU in more of the European studies. The way this was designed was, again, presenting to the emergency department, clinical question arises. Because again, sometimes the issue isn't so much for us by the time they make it to the ICU, it's for that first line provider as they're beginning to sort things out. Okay, um, can, can I clarify something? So um, you asked the question to the audience, how would you use this biomarker? We need to reflect on that. So what would you be your personal preference on how to use the combination of tests that you just presented? because I'm still struggling with the clinical application of such a biomarker test. So 
again, speaking from a U.S. perspective, yeah. I think there, there are two ways I would use it in the beginning. And again, having been talking to investigators in this trial, everybody had a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, again, in my hospital where we have a sepsis rapid response team that gets activated every time the EMR gets a trigger, which has about a 30 to 40 percent sensitivity and specificity, right? This would be a great way to save resources mm -hmm. before we all of a sudden reflexively threw piperacillin, tazobactam, or meropenem and vancomycin at them along with fluids, right? Point of care comes back right away, low light, you know, intermediate pretest probability of sepsis because of the EMR or, you know, now you have a negative, another test that makes the, the negative likelihood <laughs> ratio really helps you from comfortably pulling back and saying, mm -hmm. I'm not going to ignore the patient, I'm going to observe, right? And that's how I see it as a, a, a resource saver and as a tool to help uh, prevent antimicrobial resistance. I care for a lot of burn patients and figuring out if a burn patient is septic is horribly challenging. Mm -hmm. There's data from a, a burn study uh, with this assay showing that it very nicely differentiated just the, the routine, routine is a poor word, the ongoing smoldering inflammation of a burn patient versus actually a new diagnosis of sepsis. Uh, so I think that's really helpful. And again, I think it needs to be validated in similar populations like that, like cirrhosis, where you run into challenges. So that's how I see it. I think from having spoken to my hospital medicine and emergency room colleagues, um, their pretest probability for sepsis is lower, I think, sometimes and ratcheted down from where it should be. And this might be the yellow light that warns them to pay more attention to this patient while you're sorting it out. So those are the ways I see it. Um, but again, I think I've you know, I've talked to people in 10 different hospitals and I've gotten 10 different perspectives on how to deal with it based on what their challenges are. So a rambling answer, but I, I think that kind of gets to what you're asking. Uh, there are studies in, in the ER uh, suggesting that uh, the, the most, the, the population in which it's, it is uh, very difficult to diagnose sepsis is the patients who are not febrile. And also Craig Coversmith have, have shown very nice data about uh, how uh, core temperature may help uh, recognizing patient with sepsis. So did you look in your data? Uh, we have the vital, PSP, yeah, PSP. We have vital signs. We've not gone back and analyzed it by vital sign, but that's a great, that's a great thing to go back and think about, just like Dr. Ortegas's question and looking at these specific things, not only to tell us where it might be helpful, but also to tell us where it might not be helpful, right? Because again, it's all about figuring out what the right population is and a hypothermic population. Again, the literature is pretty clear that they, no one, no fever couldn't be an infection. And you know, that's a, that's bad anchoring. And, and so figuring out a way to help them have that warning signal that says, think about it otherwise. I think you're absolutely right. I think that's a great idea for us to go back and look at that question. Okay, thank you. If there is no other question, we will move on to welcome again Jan de Vail from Hent University to talk about now um, Terranostic biomarker for antibiotics in sepsis. Thanks, uh, indeed. It's, uh, well, from the, the session, I think it's clear we struggle to find a way to deal with biomarkers at the bedside. So it's a pleasure, actually, at the uh, last presentation of, of this uh, session to discuss one of the areas, I think, where the evidence is the strongest, where we have the, the most literature and some guidance. So let me guide you through the literature and to the experiences with using biomarkers to guide the duration of antimicrobial therapy. So this is beyond the decision to initiate it. I think it's pretty clear that we have really difficulties finding a biomarker that allows us to, to guide antimicrobial therapy initiation. But duration may be or probably is a different thing. My disclosure is not really relevant for this presentation. What is the problem in our ICU? Well, this is it. Eh? We use a lot of antimicrobials. This comes from multiple point prevalence studies done by Jean-Louis Vincent, the, 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 the president of the um, symposium. Each and every time again, it's around 70% of patients who on a given day gets antimicrobials. Differences between countries, in my country, it's around 55%. In some countries, it's higher. And this, the problem really is that a lot of this antimicrobial use is unnecessary. This could be the wrong spectrum, too broad. This could be the wrong dose. But this could also be the wrong duration. So let's 
discuss why this is happening. So why are we using all of these antibiotics? Well, a number of, of, of reasons. Of course, we, um, we are bombarded with guidance on rapid initiation of antimicrobials and absolutely true for patients with septic shock. This is not so true for patients who have not uh, a septic shock or even no signs of organ uh, dysfunction, no sepsis even. But still we'd like to expand this concept to a broad range and any situation where we would consider to initiate antimicrobial therapy. Of course we are aware that antimicrobial resistance is around and, it, and it, of course it depends on country to country. Eh? Uh, but in a lot of situations the probability of, re of encountering um, uh, antimicrobial resistant pathogens in community acquired disease may be quite uh, limited. And again, this really depends on where you work uh, and where you uh, live. A big problem, of course, is that many issues already discussed also today with the, about the, um, the, the culture techniques that are being used and the lack of more uh, sensitive uh, tools, whereas also of course, these very sensitive uh, uh, tools may provide us with too much information. So I'm not sure if we're already uh, uh, there. But also the failure to de-escalate, to stop antimicrobials that are no longer needed, to stop combination antimicrobial therapy and especially excessive duration of therapy. When we look at the bulk of antimicrobials being used, those are probably two very important areas where we can actually save on antimicrobial exposure. It's always balancing things. And in this situation, of course, you want to have the maximal effect. You want to cure your patient. You want to eradicate uh, the pathogen. But on the other hand, you want to avoid toxicity. You want to avoid side effects uh, as well. And the exact optimal duration, well, is somewhere, you know, in between. Two important side effects or two levels of side effects to be considered. The individual patient, of course, where Things like allergy do happen, toxicity, we may see it, albeit that most of the antimicrobials we use are not very uh, toxic. And things like Clostridium difficile infection, yes, it does exist, but of course we don't see it on a daily basis. Now the thing with antimicrobials, this is actually one of the very few drugs that doesn't impact alone the individual patient when it comes to the development of antimicrobial resistance, but also has an ecological impact and may change for weeks and months and maybe years to come, the ecology of the unit that you are working on. So that's a very particular uh, consideration, the impact of not only the patient you are treating, but also the patients you will be treating in six months or in six years. I already told you, I already showed you this tool that we uh, use, of course, and also for the duration of antimicrobial resistance. Yes, it has very strong uh, um, performance. Um, the thing is, we have no clue. Uh, what happens, that is something we do know, most observational studies, roughly 10 days of antimicrobial treatment for the bulk of the, the infections that we are treating in the ICU. And of course you will say, well, this is not in my ICU. In my ICU, it's always five to seven days. Well, yeah, until you start counting. And then all of a sudden, oh, yeah, we, we forgot about the meropenem. The patient received empirically for two days. And if you add it up, well, then easily you come to, to 10 days. So it's striking that it's, it's always longer than you think. And the question indeed is, is long always better? Well, the giraffe there would say, of course, yes, it is, because it allows me to get the, the, the leaves that are uh, higher. But for antimicrobial therapy, it's not so sure. So do we, use, do we need biomarkers? How can we use biomarkers to, use, to assist us in this uh, decision making? And again, two biomarkers have been studied. Well, actually only bi one biomarker, procalcitonin, has been studied extensively in this field. I will show you the uh, uh, evidence. I told you about the differences in the uh, uh, kinetics, and it appears to be um, quite suitable for this uh, gold C-reactive protein, different kinetics, but studied only very limitedly, uh, I, I, I must say. Um, and I'll show you the data, and you can judge for yourself whether we should be using either um, one. This is just one of the studies I will be going into detail, the largest uh, one, the uh, Dutch SAPS uh, study from Evelyn de Jong. Uh, lots of patients um, uh, included, 15 patients, uh, 15 uh, hospitals uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands. Now, mind you, in the Netherlands, of course, we know that the threshold for initiating antimicrobial therapy is already lower than probably average of uh, Europe. So the 
context wherein this strategy was used was already quite different. The algorithm, of course, is also important. It's not just about the biomarker, but also how you want to use it. In this case, and this really is quite similar in, mo in most of the studies, stop PCT, uh, stop antimicrobials when PCT is below 0 0.5 uh, and uh, or in a decrease of uh, more than 80% from the peak uh, at the uh, beginning of the infection. And if this, if this stopping rule is met, then the recommendation is to discontinue antimicrobial therapy. This is the um, overall uh, survival, because one of the striking things actually in this study was that the use of PCT to guide antimicrobial therapy um, actually led to a, a better survival. It's something that was, I suspect, was unexpected um, and explained, well, two options it could be related to the lower exposure of antimicrobial, to antimicrobials, because I will be showing you that in a minute. And another explanation could be that PCT also helps you to think of alternative diagnosis. And if the PCT level was maybe not that high, patients were also investigated for other reasons why they presented with the acute organ failure they were admitted with. So the jury is still out. Um, and surely this was one of the few studies that showed this, but it could have um, impacted the non-antimicrobial decision-making uh, as well. Trends in CRP in those two uh, study groups, so the ones uh, managed with PCT-guided uh, therapy and the others, they also looked at the um, uh, CRP levels, were not uh, uh, different. This is the, these are the main uh, outcomes. The antibiotic consumption, as you can see here, a significant decrease duration of treatment, but also the daily defined doses that were given. So the total amount of antimicrobials was significantly less. If you look at duration of treatment, a, um, a, um, a mean 1.22 days uh, decrease in antimicrobial exposure. So whether this could account for the lower toxicity and the potential better survival, I think it's very questionable, but still, I uh, don't see another uh, immediate explanation. I do want to point you to the um, issue of reinfection, marginally um, statistical significance, um, meaning that in PCT-guided therapy, actually, there were more uh, reinfections um, discovered, but this was not uh, this did not transpire in the repeat courses of antibiotics, which was still quite impressive in both groups, 22-23% of patients were treated again with a course of antimicrobials, but this was not statistically different. So it points clearly to the fact that there is decreased antimicrobial exposure, albeit limited, um, without too many um, side effects. Now, this is one of the areas where you probably have more systematic reviews. I think there's systematic reviews popping up every month uh, and on this uh, topic. Um, more systematic reviews than original studies that are included in it, but I do want to uh, discuss this one uh, with you when we look at the impact on mortality. As you can see here, no difference, although the, um, uh, it, you know, it's, it's a close call. On this one, you do see that the one study that was, uh, let me see if I can use the pointer here, the one study that stands out here is the De Jong study, the SAP study that I just showed you, the other studies. Of course, fewer patients uh, uh, included, and most of them could not find this difference in mortality. Uh, the duration of therapy, clear, favors the experimental, meaning PCT-guided therapy. There were differences in how PCT, uh, the, the um, PCT was used, what the stopping rules were, but overall, a shorter antimicrobial therapy with a difference, a mean difference of 1.23 days of antimicrobial exposure. Now, one important thing to consider, I think, is you look, if you look at the control um, uh, group and if you look at the uh, duration of therapy, you will see that quite often the duration of therapy is indeed shorter, but this is still um, not the seven days that current uh, guidelines actually um, uh, recommend in many situations. Just um, also adding this one on the uh, secondary infections, no difference. Um, in the, um, uh, when combined with the uh, other studies. So it appears to be uh, safe. The question is, how does this translate to the real world? Uh, because this is in you know, clinical studies. This is indirect evidence, but still, I think, important enough to just show you these data. This looks at the outcomes of patients treated with sepsis, critically ill patients treated for sepsis in the United States. 
uh, more than 20,000 patients, and in about 90%, 1919 uh, percent of the patients, PCT was used. So this didn't really look at how it was used, but just looking at patients and hospitals in whom PCT was used and what the uh, effect was. And uh, there's many things you can say, of course, about the study, but I do want to just uh, show you that uh, indeed hospitals using PCT actually used more antimicrobials in this situation and had higher rates of C. diff uh, infections while mortality was um, uh, unaffected. Uh, so it's a different analysis. It's not at the patient level, but still um, here these investigators could not demonstrate that when used, you know, um, implemented in the real world, this was not uh, possible. Some caveats to these uh, studies, small studies, the majority of them coming from Europe, and there may be differences in um, duration of antimicrobial therapy across uh, the globe. Many of them were open trials, so th these were not blinded uh, studies. And compliance, often problematic. Also in the SEP study that I showed you, uh, the, uh, when the stopping rule was uh, met, um, it took Two, day, two more days before the investigators effectively stopped antimicrobials in 90 plus percent of the patients. So it, I don't know what it is, maybe it, the, the process of slowly adapting to the idea that we can stop it, or maybe that it come, becomes more closely to what you feel comfortable with. I don't know what it is, but maybe um, there's an explanation uh, uh, there. Do also mind that a lot of patients in the clinical studies were excluded. Immunocompromised is just uh, one of them, and we discussed the shortcomings of uh, PCT and other biomarkers in, in the earlier uh, presentation. And one of them, as, as I mentioned then, was the impact of acute kidney injury and kidney replacement uh, um, uh, therapy. Um, another um, study, uh, in, in a recent one, looked at CRP to guide. This is not in the ICU or not only in the ICU but looking at gram-negative bacteremia uh, and comparing three different strategies, CRP-driven, fixed seven days, and fixed 14 days. Gram-negative uh, uh, bacteremia, multi-center uh, uh, study, uh, properly uh, investigated. And uh, this is the, the duration, the antibiotic duration in the CRP-guided group. So still, um, there is a, a lot of uh, variation, of course. The other groups, I'm not showing the, the, the figures, but it was like around 7 and 14 uh, uh, days. And actually, in this study, um, seven days and CRP guide, 7 days and CRP-guided uh, treatment were uh, equivalent. Uh, again, pointing to the same thing that I want to just briefly touch upon now, Surviving Sepsis Campaign does have uh, uh, guidance suggesting to use procalcitonin and clinical evaluation. So again, not as a standalone thing, but also um, clinical evaluation when to discontinue antibiotics. But the surviving sepsis campaign also listed or said about the duration of therapy that a short duration, which is roughly between seven, five and seven days, is okay for most, uh, uh, and, um, uh, for most infections. And these are the different studies that have looked at long versus short duration. And as you can see, if you look at the shorter duration in all these different studies for pneumonia, bacteremia, intradominal, roughly it's a, between five and seven days. And that is exactly the range that you see in the intervention studies of the procalcitonin-driven uh, antimicrobial discontinuation. So it seems that we can use procalcitonin, and especially if you work in a situation where treatments of two or three weeks are the standard, and yes, absolutely, we, you, you can use this as a tool, but if you are properly adhering to a short duration, five to seven days, then the impact will be uh, limited. So the future, of course, we'll, we'll probably go for shorter and shorter therapy. The biomarkers uh, need to, to be better studied, uh, I think. I think there's also an important connection between antimicrobial dosing and um, the uh, effect and the duration. And probably there's also differences between antibiotic classes, because now we just assume that quinolone, beta-lactam, aminoglycoside, whatever, needs seven days of uh, uh, treatment. And another dimension, of course, infection source uh, and how that plays, uh, whether we need to treat a catheter-related infection, pneumonia, and an intra-abdominal infection for the, same, for the same duration. So in conclusion, yes, we use too many antibiotics. I'm sure you agree with it, but we all... <laughs> act differently when we go back to our units. Um, we, uh, there is solid evidence, I think, that the PCT-guided duration is shorter than what was uh, 
uh, done in the control arms in these uh, studies, but the impact will be very limited if you already comply with the short duration uh, treatments. Individualizing therapy, I already anticipate to one of the questions maybe, but that's of course the future. It's just that we don't have the tools yet to properly do this, I think. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jan. The talk is open for discussion or questions. So, awaiting some questions from the room. In the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines, so the statement is suggest uh, PCT guided duration over clinical evaluation alone. And why wasn't it over a fixed duration? For example, in pneumonia, several RCTs have shown that a fixed eight-day duration uh, is not inferior to 15 days. So many uh, people will treat VAP or even uh, uh, commuter-acquired pneumonia for at maximum eight days. Mm -hmm. Well, indeed, there were two, there were two uh, types of Questions answered in the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines. One was about the duration, whether it should be shorter or longer, um, and the other one specifically related to the use of biomarkers in this context. But you're absolutely right. You can. I mean, they're all related to to uh, each other. It's just whether you use this additional piece of information um, uh, or not. So I agree. There's several angles to look at the um, to look at the problem. I wonder if. Um would the simplest solution be that if you prescribe antibiotics, the stop date would automatically be after five days? Oh, a very good, uh, a very good point. And that's uh, often what we do. Yeah. Um, and that you have to you know, justify continuing. So it's absolutely OK to, to, to do it. But that's the point, I think, in Diddley. Quite often, the decision gets snowed under. There's so many things to do. You didn't count or you, you, your PDMS or whatever you're using to monitor antibiotic therapy. Well, it, it didn't really show, especially if you were, are de-escalating, de as I mentioned before. Empirical treatment is often not considered and people start counting again or computers start counting again after the de-escalated treatment has been started. Um, but forget about the other uh, two days. So there's definitely an area where decision support systems can, uh, can help us, I think. Um, yeah. Great. I think uh, I'm conscious of time, so uh, we're going to wrap up. Thank you very much for two excellent presentations. Thank you.